technology is fantastic. Today, you get to know what people are searching for in a few clicks. If you think about it, in the three years, uh, in the last three years, the Google searches on the topic of work culture have been booming. Uh, searches to understand employee experience, psychological safety, benefits, flexibility, equality, inclusiveness. These are topics that are trending. Well, it looks amazing, but if you want to dig to core cultural challenges and answer questions regarding a specific companies or a specific industries, you really have to spend a lot of time. Well, 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 until now. At the beginning of the year, I found out that some crazy guys working with artificial intelligence were trying to read and make sense of everything that is being said on the internet from employees talking about their own work culture. So what I did is that I reached out to one of the, uh, the founders that we have today, uh, the founders of Kulturama, to discuss about building the largest encyclopedia of world culture. And I would like to welcome uh, today Andy Kaspersky, one of the co-founders of, of Kulturama, for our session today. Ha, huh. Andy, I have a really, really good question to start. How did you guys decide that the lack of insights about work culture was a problem worth solving? First of all, uh, very good morning to you, and, and thanks for having me. Um, I will go in the chronological order because I didn't go crazy from the get-go. <laughs> it, it was a process, um, and that process started when I was working as a, as a manager at a company that I consider and I still consider a great company with great resources, great support for managers. But uh, at the same time, I had this uh, dissonance that I'm working at a great company. I was given a a, uh, a very responsible role. Somebody else went crazy and they asked a 27-year-old guy to, to lead a team. And I didn't really have the time to understand the needs of my employees fully. I did understand them somewhat because I, I had the time to have um, coffee machine chats every now and then, but to really grasp where 20 people in my team were heading, that was that was a challenge. And even if I had some sort of a feeling, it was very difficult to then relay that information to the senior leadership in a, in a concise way that they would see as, as something that they need to act upon right now because they had their stakeholders, other employees, and also their customers to keep happy. And that's why uh, that's when I, I came up with um, this this feeling that there is definitely room for generating the insight to to learn about cultures, to learn about what people are enjoying working in their company, what they're not enjoying, what they see as an improvement area. Mm. And uh, some two years ago, we, we started building um, Culturama. So that was the, the, the micro scale. And the micro scale is, is something that we, uh, we explored before we embark on this journey. And there is this study from Gartner that, was, that has been mentioned in your podcast, I think countless times um, already, which, which has shown that no more than 21% of the global workforce is um, actually engaged at work. And this is a staggering number to think that four in five people are not really engaged. So staying true to, um, or doing something, trying to do something similar to what PeopleCart is, is doing, we wanted to equip people who shape people strategy with the right tool. And that's how Caltrama was born. What, what is crazy, Andy, is that the importance of understanding the culture of, of, of an organization, especially if you, you want to join an organization, it has become even more important than before. Like in my times, in fact, you go, you just compare the salaries and uh, that's the decision <laughs> because status right. and team, that was the, the key decision maker, uh, like to go and join someone. So you could work for companies in doing weapons or financials and or, or engineering or whatsoever, just based on the money and the status of the company. But right. today, more and more, and it started a little bit with the millennials, but the Gen Z 
these guys, they go really dig on the information. These guys, they really find that the salary place is the number three most important thing. In my times, it was the number one, mm. almost like dominating the other factors. So we don't care. Bad cultures, it was like the normality. So let's say that we hear about people being excluded. That's normal. This is how you learn. Having bosses that are a little bit uh, dramatically uh, bad with people, that was yeah. the normality. You you were paid in order yeah. to endure that. But today, it becomes more important. So before Culturama, so people were going into this uh, employer review website to investigate about what is the culture. Uh, today, we have Culturama. So what are the main differences that 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 we can expect from Kulturama versus these review uh, websites that we uh, that we have around the world? Yeah, so first of all, I think we we owe some credit to uh, employee review websites. As you said, it used to be very one dimensional. So people would look at different salaries that they're being offered and they usually went for the highest one <laughs> if they if they were acting uh, rationally. <laughs> but um, what these platforms has, has brought to us is the option to look at what people within the organization or who, or who have just left the organization, be it willingly or unwillingly, think about their current or former employer. So this was already a step forward in building the transparency and generating those, those insights that we just discussed. Now, the, the real issue with these websites is with their business model. So the effort to build a repository of reviews is really applaudable. The problem came where when they realized that, oh, actually our business model is that we then want to sell job ads to the people that are logging into our, our website. Mm -hmm. Because this is the only way we can we can monetize this outside of perhaps the the ads that you can, or some random ads that you can you can put on the website, but definitely this was the the best um, monetization strategy for them. So then they started to have the incentive to actually show a more favorable picture of the of the companies, which resulted in those employers that were on the platform to make sure that there is enough positive reviews for people to apply there. So if you were to compare this, if one person to, to the old world where salary was the was the key factor, if one person said that they're making fifty thousand um, dollars per year, that would be as if then ten people came and they said, no, no, we're actually making two hundred. Forget about the fifty. The average is is way higher than than what it might seem. Um, and and this is the biggest. Um, difference between those platforms and Kaltrama because we're in the business of telling you the truth about your company, about your competitors, about the the market in general. We're not interested in in abstracting that in, in any way because you know we wouldn't be making it in business. You're not paying us for learning things that you want to learn. We're you're paying us for the uh for the harsh truth that you, you don't want to hear so that you can act upon them and make sure that you don't uh, fall behind with your competitors in the in the job market. So this is what I would see as, as the biggest one. And, and then technically, those platforms are happy to take in any sort of review, um, be it an overly positive or you know, when the question is asked, so what are the cons? What are the improvement areas? People just say, oh, there are no cons, or I haven't been long enough with this company to really voice my opinion. And there are also people who are so fed up, they have just quit, and they just want to vent on the platform. So they go go on one of those platforms, and they say, everything was complete disaster. I don't want to hear about this company ever again. And we take care of those two extremes. So we had a, uh, we made a very important uh, design decision um, right at the beginning, which is that we're not gonna look at those overly positive reviews. And the reason is that it's difficult to know who has written that. Is it the company itself? Is it some somebody that was asked to write a favorable review? So it doesn't 
get you very far in terms of understanding on of how the company could improve. And we also disregard people who are completely upset with what had happened and they have just written a, a, a review that says everything was, was a complete disaster. So by, by reducing those two extremes, we only focus on, on the meat, which is, I think that my salary was too low. I was not given enough vacation and things like that have gone into our taxonomy of problems that we we then use to classify a certain company. So the, the, the last difference that I would like to touch upon is that the information in the in those platforms that we're talking about is very unstructured. So they have started to look for keywords, but it's not very advanced. And if you go to Culturama, you get a, a very concise view of your this employer in comparison to that employer is performing better in this and this and this area, and they're falling behind in this and that area. So it's it's much more concise and you really get a, a bird's view from, from Culturama. Let me confirm, tell me if, if I understood it correctly. So what you guys are doing in order to deliver the naked truth is to remove biases. And biases is, are constructed because you go to a specific site if you want to vent or bitch about your company, or you go to a specific site that probably has been paid for auditing the company and to provide a review. Yeah. And that then they are forced to... <laughs> to provide this positive review. It's a little bit like in the financial institution, we have this Standard & Poor's uh, rating of, of shares that you can pull it out. In fact, to modify the, the, what is the value of your uh, of your company, what is the rating uh, for, a, for a company. So we remove the biases by going around to any places where people are going to talk about the, uh, the company. So by really, like I said at the beginning, scanning the full internet, and looking at blogs, looking at, uh, I don't know if social media and saying if people are commenting about their company, so what is the information that they uh, that they have? And then there is this concept, the technology that you, that, that you have mentioned is about the use of natural language programming in order to understand the context exactly. of what, what people are saying. So for my non-tech people, NLP is, kind of um, artificial intelligence like patterns. So in, in terms of the language, how we say things so that the expressions have uh, a weight and importance and a context that that makes the, that makes that you are capable of kind of tagging the, the sentence into one area or, or, or the other. Is that correct, Andy? Or did I miss or I misunderstood something? No, that, that's that's absolutely correct. So one of the benefits of Culturama is that it's, um, as you said, artificial intelligence. And it doesn't have the same sort of biases that we have as people. So one uh, very common bias is that when we're reading something, uh, for instance, when I was reading from my employees or a team members' comments, I was looking for things that I was familiar with. So I had my um, preconceived notion of what the problems were. And subconsciously, I was looking, because I'm, I, I'm quite sure everyone does that, uh, if they want to admit it or not. There, I was looking for things that I was um, aware of, and I wanted to bring those to, to my uh, senior managers. So already, uh, in that situation, I was skewed to to things that I found to be to be true. Now, with uh, artificial intelligence, um, it's it's a very broad topic, and and we're now tapping to the big discussion about Chat GPT. There, it's always um, you also have the challenge with bias because it really depends on what is your uh, training set. So you hear that discussion about, you know, Chad GPT being asked to say something nice about President Trump or President Biden, mm. and then people compare how many nice things it said about Trump or, or Biden. <laughs> and there is a big discussion ongoing about, okay, is this technology skewed towards the way the Democrats think or the Republicans think? And how do we make sure that it's somewhere in the middle? Like, it can never be always in the middle. So 
uh, there is always the risk of um, having a, a bias that you sort of um, pass on to your artificial or to the model that you're developing. Hmm. The way we made sure that the that bias is limited uh, or, or minimized is that we had independent taggers that would help the um, the algorithm classify each and every review. And if we didn't agree, we would discuss, okay, why why do we have a difference of opinion? And that's why we have achieved very high quality of our of our classifier because under the hood, uh, Culturama is a, is a large classifier of those opinions. And you know, if somebody would tell you my AI is is bias free, I I would risk saying that they're they're lying. Mm. Our AI. Um, was built in a way that minimizes the bias. Hmm. What is crazy is that by default, we, the creators of artificial intelligence, our brain is already built with a lot of biases. It does not exist something that is objectively super good or objectively su uh, super bad. So it, it is the way how the way processes quick information, looking at patterns. But obviously the patterns are based on experience, a little bit like what you do with artificial intelligence. You show them pictures so that he understands associates mm. or tags uh, stuff. So our, uh, our recognition of, of, in order to quantify, qualify something, we, it is based on, on pictures. So we know how to identify lions because we have seen pictures of lions in, uh, let's say in Africa. But let's say that there is lions in, in the middle of South America that have a different shape we will have a little bit of a problem to identify this animal as a lion. Or when in artificial intelligence, for instance, we use always in order to say, this is how you identify a person who is happy, pictures of only white people, then the artificial intelligence e engine will have a little bit more of problems to quantify as happy, let's say an Asian guy, because he, he you always use white people pictures. So the bias, it is, I know it's impossible to get rid 100% in terms of artificial intelligence because already we humans have been built with biases in order to shortcut, take quick decisions uh, in, a, in our life based on experience. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and what about the, how did, um, what, there is two parts of the question. One is to understand how did you choose these different work challenges that, uh, there is uh, mm -hmm. uh, that there is in the platform, and also I want a little bit of gossip. So, what are the the, the challenges <laughs> that are 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 most often viewed in your platform? So, because right now, in fact, guys, you can access the platform for free. You can go into different work challenges. So, and and there is already a, a huge amount of people digging into this information. So, how what are these most viewed challenges, and how did you decide what is a challenge versus not? Right. So let me start with the with the latter part, uh, which is how we did we decide. So we we first had a step at finding a workplace uh, problem taxonomy that we would deem sufficient for our needs. But we have very quickly found that there isn't one generic that would cover what we consider to be a, a considerable part of what we have experienced, what we have seen in, in our professional lives. There were some models tailored towards a certain industry. Let's say that if you work in a production, there was a model of things that go could go wrong in a production um, environment, like a, a manufacturing environment. There were some models that focus on specific aspects of the well-being, but there wasn't a, a comprehensive one. So mm -hmm. what we were faced with is building our own uh, taxonomy of, of work price problem, which is also available in the in the platform. Um, and we have applied, I would say, a, a a novel approach to to building that taxonomy. So we didn't just read theoretical books, we didn't look at papers and we didn't try to come up with the with the fullest taxonomy and then generate some some data samples for that. What we did was we had a preconceived notion of what the problems, the, the challenges could be. 
and we put them into the taxonomy. And then we said, dear classifier, please classify as much as possible. And obviously there were like 50% of cases where the classifier just gave up and they said, well, this doesn't look like anything you have shown me yet. And then we said, okay, is this a problem that we can understand and one we can define as a, um, as a separate entity in the taxonomy? And if we could, we said, okay, this is your new node in the taxonomy. Please now follow this the same iterative process. And we have reached, I think, 94% of, of coverage in, in the data set that, that we have gathered from the, from the internet, uh, which is obviously you know, leaves a, a little bit of um, room for, for further development. But we sort of have the feeling that we have covered the most 130 most important challenges that that you can um, think of. So this this gives us confidence that if you look at a company, um, then you stand a very good chance of of getting a almost full picture of what the culture is. And if you look at our taxonomy, so if you're a a um, um, an expert on employee behavior or employee well-being, and you see something missing in our taxonomy, make sure to reach out, and we're always open to extend our classification. So it's definitely a living organism. We don't consider this this organism to be complete. We, we It's bound to evolve over time. Now, back to the, the gossip that you mentioned. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a very, very fun question. And, and I look at that uh, a few days ago. I would classify the things that people look at into two categories. Um, so it, it might be also uh, interesting from the behavioral perspective because there are hygiene factors that people are looking at. And by uh, to give you a specific example, people are looking at bullying or, or mobbing. And this is not the most um, frequent problem in our in our taxonomy, thank God. But it's something that people um, really look for in the in the platform, and I think it's because it's a very very uh, important issue. And and you were mentioning the 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 old cultures and how things used to work, and and that's one of the examples that you give those ruthless managers that would. Um, almost mob or downright mob their or, or bully their employees into doing something that they were not uh, necessarily willing to do. So that's that's something that most people look for. It might have to do with the fact that at a certain point we became very uh, popular with uh, social justice warriors that went on our platform and they were looking for facts about companies. They um, they try to take on and, and to show their malpractices. And we we welcome that uh, very much. We definitely want to be a platform where you can discover the truth as inconvenient as it uh, may be to, to bring it to the world. And then the second category of things that people are looking for is what I would consider the strongest motivators. So we have things like pay, we have the, the famous work-life balance. We also have uh, security, which is very interesting in the context of the AI that is likely to make some, some jobs obsolete. So people are looking for companies who have it figured out, so to speak. They look at companies that don't have a certain problem. And this is... Was I, I'm talking about inconvenient truths here, and and we're talking about challenges and and problems and so forth. We're not all that negative. So so even though we have this Eastern European culture in which you you always focus on the negative, every now and then we also focus on the positive because because we like variety, and that is why our our campaign on social media is focused on recognizing companies that score very high in a certain area. So imagine that everyone is doing poorly in pay. This is the most common problem that is reported by, by employees, by the global workforce. But at the same time, there is a company where there is the least of those complaints. 
And it's very interesting to see what those companies are. So people go into into one of the um, one of the screens in the application and look. Okay, this is the company who has figured it out. These are the companies that are not doing so well. But you know, we also have the the positive the positive examples, and and those positive examples we um, distinguish on our social media, and we create those posts about companies that do very well in, in certain areas and we are always happy to take the time to to give credit where it's due and that's the companies who have built cultures that are very strong in very specific areas i like the fact that there is it's a little bit comparable to what i was mentioning early on in the introduction about what is trending in terms of uh, of topics related to work culture. And there is a correlation between what you said, except that this time I get to not only Google and have like 10 million articles about the topic, but have a comparison, mm -hmm. a real a real comparison, a factual comparison between different companies so that I can take choices. It's more about the action that you can take next. And that relates to my next question, which uh, where I want to understand that when an organization goes and uses Kulturama, uh, can organizations learn what their competitors are doing right or wrong in the people's side? Um, and can they use this information to have like an unbeatable like value proposition? What else can they use it for by going, if I am a big company, what, how can I use this wealth of information? That's a great question, and we're getting to to the why. I I, I discussed how uh, extensively now now getting to the to the real value to to the users. Um, there are three scenarios basically. Um, scenario number one is that you're working for a large company or decision maker and an mm -hmm. HR person. You're working for a large company, and that company happens to be on the platform. And we have 1,500 uh, companies that are already on the platform. We have gathered opinions about those companies from employees around the world. We process them, and you get a, a ready-made summary. So you're in luck. Now, uh, the second scenario is that you are not on the platform, but you would like to be. And then you reach out to us, and we can repeat the same process for your company. So that's something that we're happy to do, very, very happy to expand our, our encyclopedia of, um, of knowledge about uh, work cultures. And the third scenario is one in which you have a data set that you maybe don't have the time to go through because you're working in an HR department that is perhaps swamped with paperwork. You have this many things to take care of during a day. And what you would really like to extract from your employee feedback is the essence. And you need something that you can then bring to your uh, colleagues and say, look, the thing that I was, I've been telling you about for the last 10 years, this is actually in the data. The data is in. We have run an analysis with Culturama, and this is, this is what we came up with. And then from there, so the, the, all those three scenarios lead to to this one common step, which is you can first benchmark yourself against the industry. So for every company, we say, okay, this is the industry that you're operating operating in. Let's say it's, it's the internet, and this is where you're performing better than your competitors in in that market. This is when you're performing worse. So th these are your improvement areas. This is what you should be focusing on. This is where you should be investing the efforts of leadership, of HR, and you know ultimately the whole organization to improve the culture, to to change the mindsets, to equip everyone with the right tools to to make that shift. But you also have the possibility to compare yourself to your competitor, a specific company that is already in Culturama. So if you want to compare yourself to Google, Microsoft, those companies are already there. You can uh, define that you, you want to run a comparison like that. And also you get your strengths and weaknesses in comparison to that company. 
And we have received very positive feedback um, about this functionality because when there are two head-to-head -head competitors in the job market and in the product market, say in the pharmaceutical business, the data that would allow you to compare those two cultures are very is very difficult to to get by, and that is because that is very sensitive information that we're talking about. And you cannot just go into company A and and send the survey to their employees and ask, hey, if you were to express like top three three problems that you're facing, what would those be? Because nobody's going to allow you uh, to do that if you're working for a competition. But we didn't have that problem because we were getting the data from the internet. So we have heard that those comparisons that we, we show between two companies really confirm some beliefs that people have always had, but they didn't have the data to, to prove those beliefs. And you know, whilst those people were aware of those problems, they couldn't really uh, justify or, or prove their existence to the people around them in the organization. They couldn't really get a buy-in to do some sort of transformation to push a, a change for the organization. And that's where Culturama comes into hand. It basically gives you a, a tool to hack your culture and to make this next step to differentiate against your competitors. So it go, I would put this under the hood of defining your people strategy. What is the culture that I want to build? How do I want to improve my current culture? And how do I want to draw from my competitors? How do I want to learn from them in order to improve and to become um, a company with, with this value proposition that you mentioned? So something that is quite unique is that like it is not like a static um, um, platform. Uh, it's not like going well, we talked about Wikipedia before, but now I'm going to bring it back. It's not like Wikipedia, you have the definition of a company and this is what they stand for. The mm -hmm. platform allows you, as, as you said, to do some comparison with, you can select another competitor in your industry or in a different industry that you want to be. But there is one specifically that I really liked. And, and my interest on that specific functionality came from the fact that I was looking for information <laughs> and trying to test to experiment and kind of uh, if it was true or not with my previous employer. And I was trying to, and, and I, I saw something in terms of the correlations. Like for instance, companies who pay a lot have like, they're compensating for something. <laughs> That's, that sounds funny, like compensating for a bad culture. And there was a correlation uh, between that. And I, I wanted to dig a little bit more and experiment um, a little bit more with certain topics that are quite familiar in the in the in work culture. For instance, there is this um, challenge that a lot of companies have in terms of collaboration. So, which is, by the way, one of your uh, one of the dimensions that is assessed. And mm -hmm. and there is certain correlations with. Uh, and I wanted to understand what can we learn out of the data that you have today on what impacts collaboration at work. Right. So, so if I had uh, 30 seconds to um, prescribe something to, to everyone out there who's in charge of shaping the culture or, or they're shaping the culture of their companies, it would be avoid politics because politics are the biggest killer of all collaboration in your team. And we have seen this across the board. Um, any sort of behavior where people engage in, in self-preservation and in, in some sort of power games, anything that is not based on merit is a huge killer of collaboration. And, and that's why I would point to it as number one um, obstacle in building a, a great culture. So, so avoid that um, at all costs. Uh, then uh, we, we have identified another problem, uh, which is a, a culture that is impersonal and by impersonal we most often mean one based on the numbers and that is a culture in which an employee is reduced to just a cog in the wheel 
And there is only a set of metrics or, or numbers that define how good an employee they are. And, and people hate that. This is this is what comes up as, as number two, as far as the challenges with collaboration goes. And then um, funnily enough, we get to the AI in that specific order. So we have diversity, complains about the lack of diversity, and we have a very broad definition here. It's not only diversity of your skin color, of uh, the gender in, in the team, it's also a diversity of the way you think about things, which is obviously sometimes a, a product of, of the aforementioned things. So lack of diversity also uh, stalls collaboration. Then we have equity, uh, which in, in our case is centered around the um, fairness of the promotion process. And that believe that promotions should always go go to the people that deserve it best. So if you talk about correlation, this is a very clear correlation between politics and, and favoritism and unmerited promotions. And we go to I, which is inclusion. Um, so the, the ability to, to speak your mind freely so that if you have a difference of opinion, well, maybe the company will, will not change their mind, or may, you may not be able to skew the, the company's thinking into the direction that you're thinking, but at least you should have the option to voice your opinion and say, I think in a different way, I think that what we're doing is, is wrong. And people are looking for that. So I think we're coming to a bit of a challenge, and, and perhaps it's uh, it's something that we're for leaders like like you really have something to say, which is that at a, uh, on the one side, people expect a culture that is, is very based on merit. So we don't want any politics. We don't want yeah, people talking behind our backs. We want the promotion decisions to be made in, in the first of ways. But at the same time, we don't want to we don't, don't want to base everything on numbers and metrics. That's another extreme. And you know, if you want to build a culture that is, is completely merit-based, I think it's very tempting to focus on numbers because numbers don't have emotions, data don't have emotions. And you can really fall into the trap of, of thinking that, oh, okay, so if I have a metric for everything, my team will not complain about all those politics because there will be no politics. Numbers will rule everything. We'll have a black box that will say, like the AI of, of the future, we'll have a black box that knows everything and knows who should be promoted. But at the same time, you know, what the, the, the trap that you might fall into is, is a culture that is completely based on that, that is so impersonal that only this black box exists and nothing else. So it's a... It's a very interesting phenomenon that people are comparing uh, and complaining about those uh, two separate things here. You, you know what you are mentioning, in fact, is uh, the, uh, the dimensions that influence the most uh, collaboration. You made me think about a book, um, The Culture Code by Daniel Coyle. You, you were almost mentioning chapter one, two, three, and four. <laughs> So it was very close, which made me think that the, the data that you hold is very close to some, some researchers that have been, uh, have been done on, on the topic. I also wanted to highlight the, the definition of collaboration, like in organizational design, it's not about just helping each other cordially. I, it's not exactly. transactional. It is more human. It is more with purpose. It's like having people working together towards a common goal. And then it is understandable that politics... Uh, drives competition. Competition drives, puts the focus more in the individual contribution rather than in the group it, itself, who is focused towards a common goal. And that's that's why collaboration breaks in, in uh, most of the organizations. So it's not about just the gentle, very Christian way of, to use that analogy, a very Christian way to uh, help each other, but it's, it, it's more than that. And the human Part of it is so important because it has to be inspirational. It has to be like what we are doing has a meaning and impact for society, for the good of our customers or whatsoever. So that people stand behind each other together towards the common goal and 
Yeah, that's that's impressive. I, I really like Andy this topic of, of collaboration. By the way, um, I did some research about from uh, the customers that are working me, uh, with me, and I can tell mm -hmm. you that in most of the cases, this collaboration thing is the thing that the hot potato that for twenty years they couldn't crack, and that's is a common challenge in organization. Now, we know that um, it has been a, already like a common thing that we do, especially during COVID times, to blame leadership or the middle manager, to be more specific, the middle manager about anything bad that happens in the organization. So uh, during COVID times, they weren't capable to adapt, to be agile, to, uh, to know how to empathize. Well, that's the fault of the company, not of the middle manager. If nobody equipped me, told me that this is important and I'm really judged only by results, how much sales I, I'm, I'm, I'm providing, how much productivity I'm, I'm doing and not on the dimension on how good I am with people in order to, to make them thrive uh, and be more productive at work. Of course, it, during COVID times, leadership, especially middle manager was slap around like there is no tomorrow. Is there a common set of traits that makes great leadership? So when you look at the data in, 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 uh, in Culturama, can you see some common traits of great leadership? Yes, definitely. Before I, I jump into these, uh, I would like to, to say that I, I fully agree with you. And I think that there needs to be a fundamental shift in the way we think about leaders and, and go in more into the direction of a, a ser servant leader. And I think today, middle management and and, um, and top management are giving too little opportunity to be HR people, to focus on growing the capital, to being with their with their employees. And there is definitely too much focus on um, delivering the results, on being a, a business unit that is, is profitable. They have their own. Um, targets. And this is where we come back to a culture that is based on numbers. It doesn't really matter. Obviously, there are um, great exceptions to, to every rule, but uh, it, it doesn't really matter how much human capital you have built at a company. It doesn't matter how people are collaborating. It really means if you delivered or you didn't in terms of your sales, in terms of um, putting some some software out there in terms of delivering the product to your customer. So I think uh, if we talk about hacking and, and revolution in, in the space of HR, there is definitely uh, a lot of work to be done. Now uh, to your question, uh, we definitely are seeing some, some patterns here. Um, the single most um, sought after thing in terms of leaders is their competence, which is a little bit surprising to me because I was expecting uh, some soft skills to come at the top, as in, I want my manager to be present, I want my manager to, to care for me, to see me as a person, but actually no, people are complaining that leaders lack competence. And I think it sort of is a, is a hard skill, but, somewhat isn't, I think that what the managers don't have time for is to get this intimacy with what people are working on. So they don't have the time to really understand the uh, subject matter that, that their team members are working on. And this is the challenges that people are complaining about, that they have a manager that makes the important decisions about their career, makes important decisions about the work, but actually they don't fully or in no way understand the work. So, so this is this is the biggest uh, challenge that we have observed. Then we get to caring about employees. So understanding that they have a private situation that maybe prevents them from you know, working long hours at this specific uh, time, a point in time, that People are people, they make mistakes. So this this whole soft components comes into play at this, this stage. Then, unfortunately, because it's it's not a, a, it doesn't show a great picture of the of the global workforce, we have arrogance and egocentrism that some leaders out there um, exhibit. 
no facilitation of communication inside the teams. And one that comes very close to my heart, which we haven't um, discussed yet, I think it's it's uh, definitely a very important driver of employee engagement and satisfaction, which is appreciation and recognition for um, their employees. So to boil it down, I would say we should help managers give them resources to learn and take interest into what their employees are doing, but at the same time be people per people and and really have them have a strong relationship with with their employees and give recognition where it's due uh, within those teams. So the elements that you mentioned is kind of expected, except again, the one that you highlighted at the beginning about the competency side, which I have a tendency to understand it in in a in a different way. It's not for me. It wouldn't be like a totally like a hard skill. It's almost like a meta skill. Like people do not have the bandwidth to demonstrate. Of course, how can you have a bandwidth when you need to be stressed about results and you cannot show or practice what you really I don't know more empathy, more emotional intelligence. Um, uh, different set of, of skills that are necessary in order that they get to the employees or the direct reports get to know better this uh, this leader. It's, it's almost like a, a full package that is behind uh, competency, but it's kind of a, a, a process uh, on how to demonstrate or act on this on the skills. Because many times if you ask questions to a leader about what is emotional intelligence, how can you use it? They will tell you the full book. These guys right. sometimes have read Goldman and, and they they know everything. But then you ask the right reports, are is he empathic, empathetic, the, the the leader? They will tell you no, he doesn't know anything. Because the the result is that they he hasn't demonstrated because he doesn't have simply the, the time or sometimes even the ability to demonstrate it because knowing by knowledge is not the same as yeah. making it happen. And that even happened to me. I, I'm just to be sincere, back in my days in corporate, I knew I was reading quite a lot, but in terms of ability to practice, to make it happen, that was a little bit another story. It astonished me when I received my first uh, direct report uh, 360 that in certain competencies that I thought that it was awesome, well, no, I wasn't demonstrating enough. I was also in my head. <laughs> uh, one last experiment in order to validate the power that of things that you can gather out of Kulturama is this topic about well-being. Well-being is not only about mental health, by the way, but it's the well-being in general that you have in uh, feeling well at, uh, at work. What are the biggest enablers that you have seen about well-being at work? Right, so the thing that people complain about the most is, is obviously salaries and but insufficient like increases of, of the salaries. And I would even consider it as a category of its, of its own because I think that everything else, so all the other problems, uh, really affect your expectations about the salary. As in, if the quality of your work environment is is very high, you you have a great job, you're probably happy to earn a little bit less money because you have the opportunities to grow, you have the opportunity to spend as much time with your family as as you want. You you have the flexibility of when you work, and and when you have leisure time. Um, but yeah, it's it's undeniable that this is what people complain about the most. I think that the reason is that they're so unhappy with everything else, they sort of feel compelled to complain about this area. So it's like, hmm. these are my working conditions. Given those parameters, I'm not happy with my salary. Uh, so it's it's a product of, of everything else. And I, I'm afraid that this problem is go only going to in intensify in the next years because um, of the inflation and you know the the struggle to keep up with inflation in, in many geographies, and also the um, 
the percentage of labor um, compared to GDP that is decreasing in the United States mm -hmm. and, and in Western Europe. So I think that you know, it's, it's, it's not a very inspiring message, but companies really need to think about the way they're compressing their employees when they think about the well-being. And, and those two things are, are difficult to separate. Then we have uh, subjects of workload and the number of hours you work. So there is this, um, this balance between, okay, how much am I getting um, for my work and how much am I actually spending working? It's, it's a very uh, interesting topic uh, for, for, the, for the global workforce. We have leaders' competence that we, we have just discussed. And then uh, we have a, a, a challenge and a, an enabler of uh, well-being that I'm very happy to see so, so high up the list, which is opportunities to grow. People want to have those opportunities. They want to, they have their ambitions that they want to fulfill. They want to move um, further in their career. And I think that's very optimistic because if you have that drive, then you can make all of the things solved in, with the right, uh, the right amount of effort. If you are determined to improve your career, those other things will come to you at this company or another. You will eventually move up the, up the ladder. I'm a great believer that with the right amount of hard work in most of life situations, you, you can move further. I was astonished about what you said about this financial well-being as being the uh, um, being a, a major driver of, of or a challenge, but the explanation that you gave and and this is really critical because and then I related to my personal experience. So I was working for a high-paying company with a shitty culture. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't make that I'm going to change my opinion about the bad culture, that the uh, toxic culture yeah. I was in. But you uh, stayed in that culture. But I stayed longer. So right. companies can work around that because it's not always like the the outcome of being in a in a bad culture will be I don't I deserve to be paid more for a while. I endure exactly yes. what. Yes. Yes. Uh, so you can work in your culture and avoid just having like crazy packages that a lot of companies are, are, are already doing. Uh, so it, it, there is a little bit of parallel work to about the basic need of people to be treated like with fairness, not to be underpaid because that's that's the basic need. Now the extras can come from other um, needs that are, that are covered in terms of self-development, in terms of uh, feeling belonging to a workplace. You can do the full uh, mass love pyramid if you if you want. But what I'm saying is that basic salary or fair salary is a must. The rest, you can work it around working in, in the different needs, need levels. Of, exactly. Uh, exactly. That, that, that's a good point. Um, <clears throat> listen, it was incredibly insightful <clears throat> about uh, our discussion. And I wanted to understand, Andy, um, how can people reach out to learn more uh, about you, about Culturama, uh, so that, uh, I mean, they can, uh, they can really use, start using this really good, the largest encyclopedia of work culture in the world? <laughs> Thanks for the positive feedback. I, I was also very excited to, to talk about um, Culturama and, and the value that we, we bring to the HR market. So the first thing that you can do if this was uh, of your interest to your listener is, is go to culturama.is mm. and look at our data. The only thing you need is either a, a Gmail or Facebook account, and you can log into the platform and look at 1,500 companies, compare their cultures, look at the most acute problems that the global workforce is, is facing, and also look at the correlations that Ivan mentioned. Um, you can find us on, on social media. We post insights about companies, the, the post that I, I mentioned earlier, and also 
the things that we find from from our data so interesting insights about people analytics and and the global workforce and if you like to have your data analyzed and then go to culture amadoyas there is a calendar where you can schedule a a demo with us and we can talk about applying our engine to to your data if you have a data set that is um, was collected as part of exit interviews or you run an annual survey, why not give Culturama a try and see what we can come up with? And then let's see how you compare to those uh, other companies that we already have in the system. And let's, let's make it very clear. The data that you're giving to us will not become public. So it will not become part of the demo. The demo is only the data that we have found uh, on the internet, the data that you provide to us from your employees directly, that is something that will never become public and that's something that will keep uh, private during the process. So find us on social media, go to culturama.is and if you like to learn more, please reach out. Okay, Andy, so what I'm going to do next is that I'm going to put all the links that, I, that have been mentioned about culturama.is. I'm going to put also your LinkedIn profile, Andy Kaspersky, in LinkedIn. Uh, and thank you, thank you very much, because we have been talking about doing, doing this episode already for a while. And I was so excited because I have been playing with the tool, uh, with the Culturama tool, and I got a little bit over excited because Finally, there is a good reason to have unbiased information about culture. And this is something that is like my day to day working around, uh, around culture. So I'm, I'm really happy that we had this discussion and I hope that all of our uh, audience can benefit on, the, on that. Thank you very much, uh, Andy. Thanks very much for uh, time and the invitation, Evan, and have a nice day.